The last time I went to a church back home, in Lexington, Kentucky, I was certain no human hands had touched it in years. It was a small chapel, made of red brick, sitting in the middle of a grass field on the side of a long back road. Up the road there's a hulking freight train bridge, down about 200 feet is a shorn mountain face, and across from it, an enormous pile of gravel, which reached near the height of the mountain. The mountain's peak was obscured by trees and shale, but the sky above the gravel was blue and empty. I passed by the chapel any time I drove down these roads, looked in the curtained windows, watched the ivy creeping up between the bricks. You can imagine any reason you want for why this chapel exists, who built it, why it was built, why it was built here in particular, but these questions would completely ignore what it was, how it took up space. Being near it made me feel like I was experiencing the legacy of an unknown civilization. Some people similar to me, but whose motivations I could never completely understand. It was a big red box, with a cross hoisted on the top. It had no pretensions of purpose. The last day I saw the chapel, there was a car parked outside, sitting in the grass with no one at the wheel. I parked my car on the opposite side of the building to see what was going on. Before I got all the way out of my car, I heard voices inside saying something, words that were far too distant for me to understand. I turned back onto the road and did my best to appear like I had intended to make a three-point turn, as if these disembodied voices saw me or cared who I was. I felt that I was invading the chapel's space in some way. I felt as if I'd walked in on a ghost, which in hindsight I should have expected. This place had a history, a life. I may not have understood it, but I could feel it, breathing through the walls. The next time I came... It was gone. The chapel was leveled to the ground, vanished and replaced by a mound of grey gravel. For hours I fell in the space where its body once was, unable to move, coursing gravel through my fingers, hands dusty as clay, pounding, empty. The mountain of gravel had grown larger each and every year, towering over the shale mountain, rolling over the roads, filling in crags and rivers, burying forgotten land, washing over homes lived in by spirits and memories putting up a strip mall and a dive bar, vouchers for service at a church 20 miles wide. Who is this for? All of us have been buried. We've made our lives underground. Please hold. Kentucky Route Zero is a point-and-click visual novel about how capitalism will ruin your life, and how the system is upheld by skeletons who will turn your body into whiskey. Well, kind of. It's actually bourbon. Let's start from the top. Kentucky Route Zero takes place in the area surrounding the intersection of Green River and Interstate 65. The game doesn't take place in a town so much, but more the wobbling net of back roads and collapsed structures that surround this stretch of highway. While you might think this place looks like a wasteland accompanied by lonely ambient music, you'd be right. But there's a lot more going on here than it might let on. There's a tree off the highway that's always on fire. There are some people playing a board game in the basement of the gas station who are having a lovely time without you. And there was recently a violent car crash that spilled some caskets onto the side of the road. But none of that is any of your business, really. The game initially has you playing a man named Conway, a courier who's out to deliver some antiques to Five Dogwood Drive. Everyone you speak to tells you that the only way to get there is by the Zero, a highway deep underground running through old coal mines and underground lakes. Several other people will join you, including a TV mechanic, some synth punk robots, and a boy who lives in a museum that's also a town. A museum of a town. Yeah, sure, okay. But to Conway, none of this is as important as his goal to deliver this one stock of antiques. Conway's job as the courier for an antique shop encompasses all the purposes he's living for. He doesn't have any immediate family to rely on, and Lysette, the shop owner, is an old friend from his childhood. Their relationship initially seems pretty benign, but as the game goes on, we learn that they were incredibly close when they were younger, almost lovers, until Conway disappeared to the road for years. Lysette landed in a could-be-better marriage, and Conway came back an alcoholic, desperately seeking work. Now the two of them are the only people they have. The antique shop is closing down, Lysette has lost her husband and her only son, and is now losing her memory. Both of them know, whether they acknowledge it or not, that she will eventually forget their relationship entirely. There is very little promise for Conway. All of his purpose was found in his job, and now it's all about to wither away. 
The characters that join him for his journey are in similar situations. Shannon Marquez is a TV mechanic, but her work is in low demand and she's about to lose her repair shop. Her parents died when the local coal mine collapsed, and her sister, Weaver, some weird math nerd who eats herself from the story within the first hour, I'm sure she's not important, ran away when she was younger. She too has nowhere to go. Ezra is abandoned by his parents when their house was foreclosed on. You have Julian, who is Ezra's... Wait, hold up. Sorry, Ezra's brother, Giant Eagle. <laughs> The point is, all these characters find themselves directionless because their lives were previously built around something fleeting, usually their jobs. They spent their lives putting everything into labor, living paycheck to paycheck, until their livelihoods were pulled out from under them. A coal mine collapsed, a company consolidated, a neighborhood sent into poverty and disrepair, tearing these characters from their families and loved ones and leaving them in limbo. Conway especially has spent his entire life on the road, going where an employer will take him completely distant from any place he can call home. He's strictly determined to make this final delivery for Lysette, and when Shannon asks him why, he has three possible responses, none of which mean anything good for him. Conway's entire life is built around compulsive employment, and when this job is over, he will be nothing. He needs to finish this job because, in his eyes, it's the last thing that makes him human. This idea doesn't come from nowhere. Like I said earlier, this part of Kentucky is littered with collapsed buildings, rusting husks of factories, businesses, community centers, churches. The game slowly reveals that all these places were driven under or bought up by a corporation called Consolidated Power. And honestly, props to them for making the most evil name possible for an evil corporation. It's also the name of a nuclear power supplier, who knew? Our characters' lives are precariously formed around work because they have to be. There's only so many jobs they can do and lives they need to maintain. Their livelihood can be snatched up from under them at any moment, and living exclusively to produce profit seems like their only option. They've grown to accept basing lives around labor and hoping it doesn't fall out. There's one logical conclusion to all this. Much further in the game, in a flooded train station underground, yeah, just go with it for now, we meet Poppy, the only employee of the Consolidated Power Telephone Company. She tells you about how, once Consolidated Power bought them out, she saw all of her co-workers slowly get laid off, leaving her to do the work of 12 people for exactly the same pay. You can even see the empty seats of all her previous co-workers beside her. She also tells you that the company approached her, telling her they wanted to automate her position, which she had no choice but to accept. The problem is, this was a year ago, way longer than it should take for such a prosperous company to do, if they cared enough. That's when she realizes, they don't care. Automating the system would actually cost more money than it would to just keep her there until she dies, working like a machine. She can't leave, there are no other jobs that will take her. She's forced to stay in a job that only keeps her on to avoid having to spend money. To the power company, she is simultaneously essential and worthless. Shit, that almost sounds like significant or something. And so, where does this leave us? Where can our characters possibly go from here? Tune in next time when we talk about how capitalism can turn you into an electric skeleton. It, is this how transitions work? How do they work? I haven't done this before. Oh, if today you got to call you away, what would you give in exchange for your soul? Deep underneath a lonely chapel, right next to a graveyard, is the Hard Times Distillery, a bourbon distillery owned and operated by Consolidated Power. Shan and Conway find themselves brought here unwittingly, and when they do, you're greeted by one of these lovely folk. You've heard of these people before. They're the strangers who bought up some other character's debts and keep stealing moss from some old guy's computer. Give me back my moss, you assholes! I need it for my computer to play Kublai Khan's underground caving adventure! They're the employees here at Hard Times, but you probably wouldn't know that unless the game explicitly told you. They're barely visible, but your guide can tell you their names, what they do, and how they ended up working here. This guy's name is Doolittle, by the way. He wrote this really good play called The Entertainment, you should check it out. Other than that, none of these characters even bother to acknowledge your existence. They're not quite dead or alive, they're barely present. No one works here voluntarily. Everyone at Hard Times is here because they have some enormous debt to pay off. They're here because of medical bills, unemployment, failed businesses, predatory lending, addiction. They don't work here to make a living, they work to pay off living, to free themselves from circumstances they had no control over. 
You can even see characters from a previous scene who had their debt to a bartender sold to the company for nothing. It turns out incurring a workforce of debtors makes for really good business. They stick around for a long time because they really need the money, and they're also, you know, dead. On top of that, Hard Time supplies their workers with bourbon they can drink on the job so they can owe more money to the distillery. That doesn't sound like it follows OSHA regulations. No wonder that guy crashed his truck at the beginning. Point being, Hard Times, and by extension Consolidated Power, exploits the livelihoods of everyone living here, drives them into debt, then hires them at a job that keeps them in debt indefinitely. So this is horrifying. How do you keep yourself from being exploited in a world like this? It's actually really easy. All you have to do is avoid ever buying anything from a corporation that owns all the electrical companies, the water companies, the real estate, the pharmaceutical companies, the distilleries, the energy resources, the oil. It's clear that before any of Hard Times' employees worked there, they were already too far gone. They had already been taken advantage of, and it's increasingly clear that Conway is becoming one of them. To treat a broken leg, he is forced to take a medication that is owned by Consolidated Power and is now in a large debt to them. It's okay, your leg is supposed to look like a bundle of electric bones. Just walk it off, you'll be fine. Did you know the distillery is hiring? I hear they have a great life insurance plan. And just like with every other job he's had, he thinks it's a good thing. Seemingly oblivious to the fact that the company will take over his life, will again tear him away from people who care for him. Conway has been exploited like this his whole life. No point in stopping now. It seems like Consolidated Power has a complete conquest over these people's lives. You either stay in debt to them forever, or you die to get put in their bourbon. Yeah, you thought I was kidding about that part, didn't you? They distill their bourbon in actual caskets with their corpses. Capitalism gets to exploit you even after you die! <coughs> and while the game is pretty clear about how capitalism is ruining everyone's lives, there is another force at play here. Because for all the collapsing spaces abandoned by this conquest for profit, there's something about them that isn't quite empty. There's a drive-in theater that still plays movies, even though only one person shows up. There's a bus stop, which no longer runs, but people still go there, knowing somehow it will take them to their destination. And it does because you end up driving them there. There's a small chapel, far from the interstate, with all of its lights on and a choir singing a single song over and over again. When you go inside, you discover that the choir is a tape recorder, sitting on a stage in front of a disheveled collection of pews. If you unplug the tape recorder, all the lights in the church shut off. These spaces are not empty. There is something human left. Something I haven't really brought up so far is that Kentucky Route Zero is, in many ways, a ghost story. But the ghosts in this game aren't presented in a typical fashion. They're more like memories, left over by people in the spaces they once occupied. In that sense, spirits are probably a better way to describe the memories that haunt this world. Take for example Weaver Marquez, Shannon's polymath sister. Shannon tells Conway that Weaver ran away when she was younger to escape her student debt and that no one has seen her since, except in dreams and strange pirate TV broadcasts. However, Conway meets Weaver right before Shannon tells him this, in the old Marquez farmhouse. She seems completely real, yet she speaks in conjoined sentences in vague, clairvoyant phrases. Your arrival at the Zero is basically inevitable, she tells Conway, when all this guy did was ask for some directions. Then she disappears completely. Her car in the driveway is gone, even though you didn't hear her leave. You realize she was never there to begin with, or at least a memory of her was left there. Somehow, Conway has managed to have a memory of someone he's never even met. Because in reality, memory goes beyond what we experience individually. It's the impression someone leaves on a space, like the furniture in an old bedroom or the static just on the edge of a radio frequency. You may not know who left this place behind, but you get the impression that someone once lived there, and that someone is still present, regardless of how distant they are. All of our main characters are haunted by some of these distant memories. Conway was hooked on his faded relationship with Lysette and ultimately lost all of that to old age and unemployment. Shannon's parents died in Consolidated Power's minds and now she spends much of her time wondering how anyone can really get by under the company's influence. Ezra has been wanting a family ever since his parents left him. 
And then we have Junebug and Johnny, who are precious, and I love them. Junebug and Johnny were originally created by Consolidated Power, exclusively to clean up the rubble in the collapsed mine. They were genderless, had no eyes, and supposedly had no sentience, until they discovered tapes of old folk songs performed by the lost miners. These recordings were enough to make them develop their own sense of humanity. They develop eyes, they perform genders, and end up hitting the road to become musicians themselves. This is relatable, because my personality too is a sparse collection of music interests that I dug out of a hole in the Appalachian Mountains. While they were originally created to be senseless, inhuman machines, the spirits of people who came before them are what make them human. It is possible, however, for characters to align themselves too closely with these spirits. Conway's downfall happens because he clung too close to his dying relationship with Lysette, and truly believed the promise that going where the work goes would eventually save him. Weaver lost herself too, by running away from the family and debts that haunt her. In turn, she becomes a spirit herself, broadcasting herself through TVs, radios, and dreams in a desperate attempt to reconnect with others. Our other characters, meanwhile, learn to live with their spirits, and carry on to preserve their memory. Shannon joins Conway in part because she sees that he's suffering and doesn't want him to fall prey to consolidated power the way her parents did. Ezra comes to see Johnny and Junebug as father and mother figures, and neither of them want to keep wandering the road forever. Making a family together would settle some of their own anxieties. And in learning to live with their spirits, each of them end up living with other people. Individualism led them to be lost and exploited, but living for others, including those from the past, makes them better prepared to live on. So, where does this take them? After Conway has lost to hard times, the characters take a ride on a ferry to an underground lake called Lake Leth. It's literally the underworld. This is where all the people and things discarded by an exploitive system have gone to find their own life. This guy drives the ferry. His name is Will. He likes playing the organ in his spare time, but most of his life is spent just carrying people along the lake. That's it. That's just what he does. He eventually takes you to a silo, one that tunnels so deep underground that echoes reverberate in it for years and years before they finally reach the top. And at the top is Five Dogwood Drive. The town you arrive at has been devastated. There was a storm during the night that flooded the center of town and destroyed the local TV station. Nobody died in the disaster, but the storm killed two horses known only as the neighbors, who have lived in the town long before any of the residents have. And because of the neighbors' death, nearly all the residents are moving out to seek life elsewhere. And yet, right behind the TV station, this stage building thing appears, which the residents tell you didn't exist before the storm. This is Five Dogwood Drive. As our characters walk around town, chatting with the residents, we learn that this is far from the first disaster this town has faced. Long ago, the town was inhabited by a tribe called Un Puebla de Nada, the people of nothing, who supposedly fell apart due to a moral catastrophe. Another community came in long after, which eventually fell apart due to a tyrannical governor, who eliminated libraries, businesses, and people in the name of efficiency until everyone in the town left. At some point, Consolidated Power tried to set it up as a company town until they realized they couldn't make any profit off of it and abandoned its residents. Yet, these communities never died, not entirely. The buildings made by Un Puebla de Nada are still standing, and the people abandoned by Consolidated Power learned to live on their own. They set up their own shops, grew their own crops, created a TV station, even set up an airstrip to fly prop planes, which they built themselves. Despite all the catastrophes that have faced this town, it has lived on, and the people have given it life. There's something else, too. The spirits of this town are here. You can see them, walking around, talking to each other, just like anybody else. They're actively involved in the well-being of this town. 
They occasionally cut the screen to black to tell you that they saved what they could and buried the horses so this town could carry on. If you're wondering how someone ordered a delivery to an address that previously didn't exist, it was probably their doing. This town brought you here, with a truckload of antique furniture, so you could make a home here, so you could carry on this town's persistent legacy. It worked for our characters too. At Five Dogwood Drive, Shannon can set up her new shop. Johnny, Junebug, and Ezra can set up as a home or a new stage for their performances. Clara, who we just met on Lake Leth, can perform her music here too. While there are a few people here now, Johnny notes that the town has a way of drawing people. And Shannon notes that while they don't know who ordered the furniture, by making a life there, they are making this person together. For once in their lives, our characters have found a reason to carry on, and that purpose is to live for each other, to persist, like all those who came before them. Throughout this game, these characters have had every reason to let go of their lives, to give up, to eke out an empty, isolated existence, to submit to the will of a capitalist system that would see them whittled down for profit until they were nothing but bones, seeking a purpose in a world that seems purposeless. Which is completely empathetic. It's natural for us as humans to want a purpose to live. I think this game understands that. But it also understands that whatever that purpose is, it cannot be self-isolating and you can't let anyone sell a purpose to you. Exploitation and suffering come and go and are always present, but people who live for each other have always persisted, no matter the circumstances. To live for others in the community is the most powerful human legacy to be a part of, because humanity is a greater calling to live for than just staying alive. <laughs> Basically my point is go support labor, we're all fucking dying.